Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another TPN webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and cyber awareness. Um, my name is Greg Mason. I'm the head of legal at TPN Credit Bureau, and with me today is Amy King of Amy King Legal Consulting. Amy provides legal consulting services to a host of clients, including TPN, and she has expertise in um, the Cyber Crimes Act. Also with me today is Alison Williams. Alison Williams is, a, um, is the head of intellectual property at Norton Rose Fulbright, South Africa, and is also on a digital transformation team. Uh, Alison, tell me a little bit about that team. Yes, Greg, thanks for having me. Um, the digital transformation team is a panel of directors <coughs> in our South African office that is looking at innovation and being futuristic. Mm -hmm. And this involves analyzing issues of intellectual property law, technology law, and data protection law. So as in addition to being an expert in intellectual property, I also focus and specialize in data protection law. Mm -hmm. Alison is also an expert in the Protection of Personal Information Act, which is something which we have all been getting used to over the, over the past years. Um, today, we're going to be talking a bit about cybersecurity. So, in 2019, there was a large cybersecurity breach with the city of Johannesburg, which involved a shutdown of the client-facing services for the city. This included e-services and included the government website and even went as far as to include um, the emergency telephone lines for emergency services. Um, Amy, that attack in particular, um, we heard that it's a ransomware attack, but tell us a little bit about what a, a ransomware attack involves. Well, basically, they just <coughs> encrypt, they use malware to encrypt mm. your data and then hold it ransom mm. um, and ask for a, a reward, usually in cryptocurrency. So they try and ex extort money out of you to basically give you back the information that you, you have. Absolutely. Mm. We were told that the city of Johannesburg didn't, um, didn't concede to these um, requests and managed to get everything um, back up and online. Um, before we get fully into the topic of cybersecurity, just a little bit of housekeeping. Please make sure that you are logged in on your browser <clears throat> to ensure that you have, <clears throat> excuse me, you have access to the live chat function. Please get involved with that live chat. We will be taking questions. We'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, we'd love to hear what you have to say on the topic. Um, if we're looking a little bit blurry to you, please go and click the cog icon in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Um, make sure that you are at least using 720p resolution or higher, make sure that you can see all of our faces. Thank you very much. Um, so Amy, I'm going to be handing over to you. You're going to be giving Thank us a little you. bit more information about the overview of cybersecurity in South Africa and just showing us a couple of examples of, um, of cyber attacks that have taken place and what to look out for. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you, Amy. Greg. Thank you for having me. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I think we'll just get straight into the bad news. Um, <coughs> Mimecast is an email management service system and every year they conduct a review of um, the emails that go through their system and they found that in 2021 it was the worst year on record for cybersecurity. So it seems to be going from bad to worse every single year. According to the report, phishing was the main culprit and it caused <coughs> which caused 36% of data breaches emanating from the theft of employees' credentials through phishing attacks. Now, as you all know, phishing attacks can occur through telephone, WhatsApp, email, but 96% of those successful phishing attacks were conducted through email. Now, we use email every single day. So we know that email is the main vector that cyber criminals use. So we need to be very careful and train our staff who are the end users on email to have cyber security at the forefront of their mind all the time. Amy, is the increase in numbers because of the pandemic? So it was most certainly exacerbated by the pandemic. So we had these high cyber um, <coughs> attack levels. And then when the pandemic hit, everyone went home. Everyone started working remotely. Everyone was panicked. And what these cyber criminals do is they prey on your fears. So they use the pandemic to get people to click. And it was mostly about COVID. Um, and those were the, the successful mechanisms that they used. So now is a really good time to have this training because the Cyber Crimes Act has literally just come into force. And it's really bad, the stats out there. Yes, it's absolutely. And we recommend that you have all your staff <coughs> regularly trained on cyber awareness just to keep it at the forefront of their mind. Um, take extra uh, lengths and put posters up all over your offices with think before you click, um, beware of cyber criminals, don't open suspicious emails, 
And um, Ali, you had an example of Norton Rose Fulbright, what they do with external emails. Yes, so um, Norton Rose Fulbright, obviously law firms are often targeted in, um, <coughs> in cybercrime. Um, they hold a lot of valuable confidential information. What Norton Rose Fulbright does is, in order for you to not be kicked off their systems, they have three mechanisms that they use primarily. In order not to be kicked off their systems, you need to conduct online training, cyber awareness training. You need to uh, at least achieve 80% 80, 80 for that training. If you don't conduct it on time or achieve the, the, the correct percentage, then you, you cannot access the system. Mm. It's as simple as that, which means you cannot work. Second, if there's any external email that comes into your inbox, um, there is a red block that marks it external email, exercise caution, so that every single email you get that comes from outside the organization is made, it's, it's, it's made very um, <coughs> obvious and conspicuous that you need to exercise caution. It's a red flag. And also, they conduct, um, they started in the last couple of years because of the increase in, in um, phishing attempts and cybercrime, they have started um, random uh, phishing attacks mm. or tests on the employees <clears throat> and if you don't pass those tests you do get mm. wrapped over the knuckles by um, the IT department and I consider myself quite a security oriented person that specializes in data protection and I got caught in three phishing attempts um, because they are so sophisticated these criminals now they actually use things that are very relevant to your life. Mm. For example, during COVID we we're all ordering online products so it would be a simple email saying your product is ready for collection please click here, you click. Yeah. So that's really just some practical examples. It's very important to note that um, they are very targeted in the way that they go about these phishing um, attempts. So they will look into a background, they'll see you know, activity of what you could potentially be doing. And as you yeah. say, approaching things like um, online shopping where it's, uh, there's a great increase in it during the pandemic, and specifically <coughs> targeting things like invoice receipts and saying click here to confirm your receipt and then you know you you get redirected to a login page. You give your yeah. login details, and there you are. And if someone you know like yourself can fall victim to um, <laughs> at, at least an internal yes. phishing test, then it goes to show that there's no one who's immune. Um, so they also where they're realizing that a lot of these cyber attacks are as a result of um, human error. Mm. It's it's more social engineering now, mm. more than the than increasing the technological. Mm. Um, aspects of the, the hacking. Mm. So you are, you are at risk because your employees mm. are vulnerable and if you don't train your employees mm. then your organization is at risk. You are vicariously liable for what your employees do. Mm. That's why we are holding this training today for all of our clients to bring this awareness to you and show you the significance of it and how important it is to an organization. Exactly and um, TPN is going to be hosting further cybersecurity training in the future. Um, we're aiming at doing a, a presentation on end user training so that we can specifically look at um, things to, to look out for. Just as an example when Alison mentions the block which says that uh, an email is coming from an external source. Say for example you receive an email who is from your direct boss but the block pops up that says it's from an external domain and you then know to go and hover over the email address and you see, oh, it shows the name of my boss, but the um, email address is something that's completely unfamiliar. It's things like that that you need to keep at the front of your mind because you can have your policies and procedures in place to protect your organization, but at the end of the day, it is the end user who provides the most risk to organizations and to yourself in a private capacity as well. So training from an end user perspective is vitally important um, in terms of the legislation. Uh, I think it's also important to remember that every data breach results in your data, large portion of the population's data going into the dark web. And it's that data that informs <coughs> these phishing attempts. So they're extremely sophisticated. When there has been a data breach, they find that there's an extreme increase in phishing attempts. Um, last year, following a, a data breach, they found there was a 300% increase in sure. phishing attempts. Mm -hmm. So when there has been a data breach publicized in the, the newspapers, it's best to do a refresher training for your staff mm -hmm. on phishing and obviously take those steps that we've recommended. And also evidence all of your training. Um, it seems that we actually have a question. Um, yes, Jade. Sorry to interject, just no that problem. a few of our clients are asking this question. <clears throat> So I have a question from Marilise van Rooyen. She says mm. one of her clients was involved in her data was compromised and she was offered 
free true identity protection for 12 months. Mm. So the question is, if you were in her shoes, would you take it? I would. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think anything practical um, that, <clears throat> you know, I would, I would obviously find out if that's reliable, mm. if it's not going to add an extra uh, level of risk. I mean, mm. one of your duties as a responsible <clears throat> party under Poppy is to um, ascertain all potential internal and external risk mm. to your personal information. So first check out the viability, but yes, I would definitely take all reasonable you need to, you, the law is that you need to take all appropriate, reasonable, technical and organisational measures to protect the lawful, um, the, um, to protect unlawful access to your information and mm. the loss and destruction of the information. That's um, under Poppy. Exactly. And it's a sort of, um, it's a sort of service that can help you monitor going forward. You know, if there's any changes, I mean, the, the, one of the big factors with when your data is lost is that if that data is then received by someone else, they can use it to try and open up other credit accounts or, you know, potentially try and apply for lease agreements. Um, and being able to monitor and see when that's happening on your profile is, is an important um, thing to have. Um, thank you, Ali. Yes, Amy. So I think let's delve into what's happen happening in Africa. So Interpol dis did a study uh, last year um, into the cyber threat um, environment in Africa. And basically what they said is the internet has um, dissolve borders. So whatever happens in Africa is affecting the world and <clears throat> it's so important for us to work together um, <clears throat> uh, intercontinentally um, to try and tackle this problem. So they said in Africa it's, it's under a huge amount of threat. 60% <coughs> of the population in Africa is under 25 years old, which means we've got a large number of the population that are tech savvy, um, that are online and are using the internet. There are 500 million internet users in Africa, which wow. constitutes 38% of the population. So that's not even half, which means that the growth of internet users in Africa is going to be exponential over the next few years. When we have growth in internet use, we have growth in cybercrime. So it's not really a question of if, it's a question of when. When, when you will uh, face a breach. Yeah, when you will be mm. a victim. Yeah. Um, we have the fastest growing telephone and internet networks in the world and they identified that a gap in law enforcement and cyber, cyber capabilities within and across the region is a key factor that is enabling the cyber criminals. They're taking advantage of networks and infrastructure and the weakness that we have in law enforcement in the cyber space. But that's why the Cyber Crimes Act is great. Mm. Yes, so it's the first major step that South Africa has taken to try and tackle this onslaught. Okay. Mm. That's what, didn't you say once, who needs a gun when you have a keyboard? Yes, <laughs> it was actually a quote from Wired, um, <laughs> that it's such an effective um, a means of wreaking havoc um, mm. through cyber threats. Um, South Africa has 56% of its population online, so again, uh, it's, it's just over half, which means that the growth over the coming years is going to be exponential. And the concerning thing is Interpol found that 90% of businesses in Africa are operating without the necessary cybersecurity protocols. In 2016, this is before the pandemic and the rise in cybercrime, South Africa lost 573 million US dollars due to cybercrime. COVID obviously accelerated this, so we can only begin to com comprehend the um, magnitude of the damages that are now being sustained. According to Accenture, South Africa has the third highest number of cybercrime victims worldwide at a cost of 2.2 billion a year, with 577 malware attacks per hour. Wow. Attacks across critical infrastructure and frontline services in the year before, so 2020 to 2021, um, were most prominently seen in South Africa and Botswana. And you'll see as I go through these slides, there's this trend that South Africa is featuring at the top of each category, which is very alarming. Mm. Something to really pay attention to there is, um, you know, at the top of, at the top of um, this, we mentioned that the city of Johannesburg was covered, which is obviously a um, largest scale attack, mm -hmm. but they're not limiting themselves to large businesses. This is something that affects every business of every level, mm -hmm. um, regardless of the number of employees that you have. Yeah. It is so um, potentially easy if you don't have policies and procedures in place for your business to be targeted by cyber criminals. Oh, there's, there's no discrimination on yeah. what business gets. Uh, what I would covered. say on that though, is that Poppy does say that if mm -hmm. you, um, if you, depending, you need to take all reasonable and appropriate technical and organizational mm -hmm. measures. So the more, 
personal information, the more sensitive personal information mm. you hold and process, the more obligation will be on you to mm. protect that information. And uh, you know, if you're a credit bureau like TPN, yeah. I and mean, TPN's been a client of Dalton Rose Fulbright for 15 years, mm. your obligations run deep. Mm. Um, you know, you've got a serious obligations. You also need to look at industry standards when you're protecting security of the mm. information. So yes, it applies to everyone equally. Well, not, it applies to everyone, but not equally. Of course. Depending on the nature of the information you hold. And it's very important, for example, if you log onto the TPN Poppy portal, you can run your um, prote uh, data protection impact assessment, and you can go through your business and identify your gaps um, in, your, in your business to see exactly what level of risk you hold, what level of information you hold, and the steps that need to be put into place to sort of mitigate your risk. And Greg, that's an interesting point under Poppy because mm. um, from December 2018, I think it was, um, and when Poppy came into force at, mm. uh, in July last year, all information officers of every entity in this country have to do a, a personal information impact assessment. Effectively, what that is is a gap analysis. <clears throat> where are you in compliance mm. with Poppy and where do you need to be? And um, by the first of, uh, you know, it's, it's fully in force now. Mm. You don't need to go and reinvent the wheel. I believe that TPN yeah. as Poppy Portal product has done this for you. This is exactly the purpose of why the Poppy Portal was, um, was developed. Okay. It was to create a impact assessment that you can run on, um, on this portal and you can do the statutory compulsory um, assessment of your business. Um, that Poppy portal, if you haven't got it already, is available at shop.tpn.co.za. Um, you can go on and purchase it on, on the portal there. And if you do your impact assessment, mm. are there any tools that Poppy portal offers to sort of help you once to get where you need to be once mm. you've done your gap analysis? Of course, obviously you can identify, the, um, you identify the, the gaps in your business where you have risk. And then important is to have policies and procedures in place to mitigate that risk. So if you go to the tab on the left hand side that says policies, you get things like an access management policy, which um, provides you with um, proper password protection. Um, you have backup and restoration policy. We mentioned ransomware, where um, someone gets in and encrypts and locks all your information. If you have proper backups in place that you can restore, you can at least limit the amount of damage that's going to be suffered in that's terms important. of those attacks. Yes, yeah. so you can restore it. Um, Amy, yes. yes. So I just wanted to emphasize what Greg said, that although all the examples we see in the paper are large organizations, they are targeting smaller organizations every single day because it's a, it's a, a financial means um, mm. for them. So um, <clears throat> my father is a farmer on the south coast in KwaZulu-Natal, and he was actually targeted with ransomware, and everything was encrypted, and he lost everything. So mm. it's not just the big organizations, it's, it's you and me that are, are at risk as well. Um, so in January 2020 to February 2021, uh, Trend Micro, who partnered with Interpol in the study, found that they had 679 detections um, of cyber attacks in, via email, and South Africa had the highest, with 230 million of those being in South Africa. So you said there were 679 million, million email attacks. Yeah. That's staggering. This is not a list you want to be top on. No. Yeah. <laughs> And 219 of them are related to email threats for South Africa. Yeah, yeah. so South Africa is being specifically targeted. Absolutely. Um, Do you have any tips for, I mean, I've given you the Norton Rose Fulbright examples, but other tips for being careful on email? Yes, yeah, so actually the FBI um, have uh, published a list, which I'll just get us to. No problem. Okay. So basically the FBI have highlighted five points that you need to actually be aware of when you're looking at emails. If there's an unexplained urgency, um, ask yourself the question, why, and get on the phone and talk to the person. Um, SARS, uh, you get those, uh, mm -hmm. SARS yes. is trying to get hold of you and everybody's Could terrified of penalty, SARS. Click yeah. on the link. <laughs> Anything that's threatening and urgent. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, any last minute changes to the recipient account information? Any last minute changes to the established email accounts or communication channels? And the refusal to communicate via telephone or voice, online voice notes or video platforms? I mean, that's your, your first key. If they don't mm. want to talk to you, then they're hiding behind an email that's not legitimate. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely a red flag that you should pay attention to. Absolutely. Yeah. And then request for advance payments um, of services wherein you never usually had to pay up front. What, like, a, like purportedly from a client? Yes, mm. of course, okay. a supplier. Yeah. Okay. 
Sorry, I'm just scrolling back. Here. I think we see quite often with those, you'll get an invoice all of a sudden out of the blue and it's a threat of legal action will commence immediately if this is not mm. paid. And a lot of times the threat of legal action is something that people get a bit scared of. Yeah. So, I mean, I think understandably. That, I think we need to be educating <clears throat> ourselves that mm. the thing to be scared of is a data breach. Mm. And every communication that you, that you enter into red flag Mm. Cyber security needs to be top of mind exactly. for every person in your organization at every level mm. from the top to the bottom. It's mm. not just the responsibility of IT. Yeah. It's not just the responsibility of the board. It's the responsibility of every single person in your organization. Okay. And that's why you need to take responsibility for training your people, for ensuring that you evidence the training, have training mm. registers, because if you do suffer a breach, and your, your penalty under Poppy is going to be determined by mm. the extent to which you took the necessary measures to protect mm. the, the, the security of the information. And we know that those um, penalties can be vast. I mean, they can be up to 10 million rand, uh, up to uh, a percentage of turnover, up to 10 million rand. Yeah. So but as I say often, is the, the fine is alarming, but the damage it does to your business will far outweigh the, fi the damage that the fine mm. does the to your business. The reputational risk. The reputational risk is the downtime, the, the cost in rebuilding your systems is alarming. Yep. Yeah. So they found that the average downtime with a ransomware attack at the moment is 21 days. So you can only imagine the, the implications for you if your business is closed down for 21 days and is not able to function at, at optimum level. Mm. Yeah, especially nowadays when everything is conducted in a digital space, you know, it's not like back, yeah. back before when everything yeah. was done on paper, you can't go and find a photocopy necessarily. It's, yeah. If it's in your systems and your systems are locked down, that's a huge potential loss of income. Well, when Life Healthcare um, was hacked last year, they actually had to resort to manual systems, as did Transnet, yeah. because the, the port actually had to declare force majeure because it was it was brought to a grinding halt. Yeah, mm. really sets sets yeah. everyone back. And then the, the the ripple effect of that is alarming because, mm. I mean, it's the port. It's a major port in southern Africa, and that's that affects food supply, food mm. security. I think it's also um, important to bear in mind that it's extremely difficult to get cyber security insurance, mm. get insurance against cyber crime. There's, the insurance companies are simply not prepared to take the risk. Mm. But we do recommend that you, you look into it. And, <laughs> yeah. and often the insurers <clears throat> will recommend what you need to do to, to get the insurance. And obviously that's always a good idea. Like a if cyber can, resilience plan. Yeah, if you have the resources. Cyber resilience plan is absolutely critical to know how you will react when they, how you will prevent an attack and how you will react and, and build up again after an attack has taken place. So TPN is in the process now of developing a cyber resilience plan. Um, we will release it um, as soon as it's ready for everyone. So at least we can take um, a little bit of the headache out for, um, for our clients on that to make sure that you have a proper plan implemented with regards to your cyber security going forward. So that you're also uh, less reactive and more proactive. Exactly. Taking positive steps, making sure you have your policies and procedures in place early is a good tool to trying to um, um, proactively prevent this sort of um, situation. So I think with the resilience plan, what it emphasizes is that this is not just an IT problem. It's not the IT mm. um, supplier or independent contractor or department that you have. Mm. It is an entire from top to bottom problem for the organization and boards mm. need to collaborate with their staff and their teams and work to ensure that their, that their staff are educated on the threats because even though what we're saying may seem so obvious, people are caught every single day by mm. very obvious um, clicking and not thinking. Exactly, it's important to put that emphasis on a shared responsibility. It's not, um, it's not something that can necessarily be delegated off to someone else. You need to make sure in your own um, area you're, you're accountable for your own um, training and knowledge and um, making sure that you're keeping an eye out for these, these attacks. I think yeah. it's, it's also important um, in terms of section 19 of Poppy. Um, I've already mentioned every responsible party, that's the person who determines the how and the why the information is processed, the purpose and the means mm. of the information. Um, you have to take reasonable technical and organisational measures to mm. secure the integrity and the confidentiality of the information. But in addition to that, you also need to be looking <coughs> at all potential internal risks, external risks, putting safeguards in to manage that risk. Um, also making sure that you maintain and implement those safeguards and that you update them when necessary. Significantly, if you get someone to process information for you and they don't come under your direct authority, 
they are an operator in terms of Poppy, yeah. and you need to ensure that you enter into a written contract with them so that you contractually bind them to the obligations that you have as a responsible party under Section 19 of Poppy. Exactly. So back to Interpol's study of Africa and, and the cyber la landscape, um, they identified five types of major cyber threats in Africa. The first is the most obvious, the online scams. That's the phishing, credit card fraud, um, identity theft. And they found that the most common um, uh, attack vector is phishing, which is facilitated, as we've mentioned, by emails, SMS and phone calls. And in 2020, there was 238% rise in cyber attacks on online banking platforms, which is uh, terrifying. And you mentioned <coughs> the attack in Johannesburg, and that was actually mm. a twin attack. So at the same time, they launched a massive DDoS, which is a denial of service attack on the major banks. And mm. it was all time for the end of the month, at the end of the payment cycle. Yeah, so it was a huge place. disruption. <laughs> um, and that causes instability. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's very struck. It's very structured and pointed, and exactly how it goes it's about. Very and I think to that's a good word because mm. the very purpose of a data breach is to create instability and as much instability mm. as as can be created. And um, Stanford University found that 88% of data breaches are caused by human error. So you can have all the technology in the world. You can have the best perimeter around your your um, systems, and at the end of the day, if someone makes an error, you you're in trouble. And that's why we just have to emphasize train your staff in which we will be facilitating yeah. and we'll be providing some training for your staff as well in the near future. Um, the next one they, they identified is digital extortion, which is blackmailing or sextortion. And the top country for digital extortion um, included South Africa, where these are emanating from. So once again, we see South Africa featuring at the top of the list. Um, business email compromise is our biggest nightmare. Um, they target companies for financial gain or, uh, or data theft. They pose as legitimate owners of email accounts. Um, they ask for transfers of funds and they target the top execs with phishing, keylogging or spoofing and send <coughs> emails from their accounts to employees asking for payments to be processed, etc. And again, South Africa was detected with the highest number of BEC um, attempts at 34% in Africa. So just explain what BEC is, sorry? It's business email compromise. Okay, so, so specifically fishing. aimed at businesses. businesses yeah. yes. And one thing that we uh, sort of discussed yesterday, which was quite um, a good terminology, is when they really go after those high profile people, instead of calling it phishing, they call it whaling. Yes. Because they're really <laughs> going after those high profile uh, individuals to try and get the maximum level of um, they want to get a big out of it. It's almost like yeah. we need a new vocabulary <coughs> to understand exactly. cybercrime. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing they identified is botnets. Basically, they hijack um, computers and then they use them to spend, send spam, launch DDoS attacks. Um, and they may even rent out these hijacked networks to cyber criminals. And any device that is connected to the internet, even your, your nanny cam, can be used um, as a botnet. They detected 3,900 detections monthly of botnets in Africa. Um, again, South Africa, um, a South African internet service provider became a, a victim of a DDoS attack and they were brought down for an entire day and these are people that specialize um, in internet services. So if they can be subject to an attack, then we all can. Mm -hmm. um, I've mentioned that the South African banks experienced that attack at the same time as the Johannesburg um, city. The fifth one was ransomware, which we all um, keeps us all awake at night. It's basically malware, which I mentioned earlier, that encrypts data or locks down systems so that you cannot get access to it. And then they ask for um, a ransom in exchange for uh, decrypting the data or releasing the systems. The average payment for ransomware is now 300,000 US dollars. As I mentioned earlier, the average downtime is 21 days, which is um, it can have catastrophic effects for your business. Your business cannot survive being down for 21 days. Most businesses mm. can't. Mm. Um, a ransomware attack occurs every 11 seconds in Africa, and there were more than 1.5 million detections in 2020. Again, in the first quarter of 2021, South Africa um, appeared in the top number of highest detection counts across Africa. And again, they've seen the highest increase in these attacks between January and April 2021 at a 34% increase. And we were most heavily affected by targeted ransomware in the first quarter of 2021 in Africa as well. There was a stat that you mentioned a little bit earlier, which I just want to bring us back to, because it, we just need to appreciate the scale of what we're dealing with here. Mm -hmm. It was, I think it was in 2016, you said, the 
GDP, it was 10% of the GDP of the entire of Africa was lost to yes. cyber attacks. I think that was in 2020. In 2020 so in 2006, sorry, yes. 2016, we lost $537 <clears throat> million, mm. um, due to cyber attacks. And that was before the pandemic. Yeah. So you can only imagine how much South Africa is losing. I don't have the figures for South Africa mm. alone. Um, but it just shows it's on the rise and it's a huge scale when 10% of the GDP of a continent can mm. be lost to essentially cyber theft. It's, it's a staggering scale that we're working with. And it's only going to get worse. Exactly. I mean, that's what we're seeing every year, year on year. The stats are just alarming. The increases are over 100% with mm. almost everything. Exactly, which is why, again, it's so important to make sure that you are taking positive forward steps. And to educate yourself. And to educate, yes. And then these examples of attacks we've actually mentioned and been through, so I'll move on. Okay, so Maersk also sustained a serious attack. It brought the entire systems down, even their telephone lines. And the way they were able to rebuild their systems was that there was one computer in Nigeria that was offline at, at the time. Um, and that poor soul had to get on a, on, a, <laughs> on a plane and fly abroad with the laptop on his lap. Um, and that was their, their means of rebuilding their business. So their losses were catastrophic. <clears throat> and um, Adam Banks was the head of technology at Maersk at the time. And his key takeaways from that and the lessons that they learned were prevention is unlikely to be an effective strategy. You have to have prevention. It's part of your cyber resilience plan. You have to have the software in place to secure your perimeter of your, your systems. That's also a positive obligation on you in terms of poppy. Absolutely, mm. yes. And then um, he said automate, automated detection and response is key. So again, that's a software issue. Um, privileged access management. Don't give everybody access in your organization mm. to your systems if they don't need it, um, because then it limits the number of computers that are affected once there is an attack. Mm. Yeah. Um, he said the biggest thing is that this is not just a technology problem, it's a business problem, and everyone has to work together to collaborate within an organization to keep an organization safe. And his greatest emphasis on, on Maersk after that was awareness training. He wanted to make sure that all 88,000 employees are trained. And that's someone even that's packing the, the containers in the port. If they have access to a computer, a cell phone, there needs to be cyber awareness training for every single individual in your organization. Because as we said, data breaches emanate from human error. Um, I think it's very important as well to know that um, from your access control point of view, making sure that everyone has their own individual login credentials, mm. login credentials aren't shared around in the office, um, making sure that each individual party has their own, um, almost an audit trail as well, so you can yes. also identify where issues may fall in in the future, um, and making sure that you have your systems um, properly set up and in place to make sure that you are. Yeah and a, a strong password system policy. Exactly. And there is an app called LastPass. I know a lot of the TPN employees use it. Mm. LastPass will actually generate a secure software, mm. a, a secure password for you mm. on the app, and then you keep a record of all of your passwords. And it has nothing to do with your life. Mm. So it is a very secure password. So that's also a very good policy to put in place. Exactly, and um, <coughs> again, some of those policies you can find in the TPN Poppy Portal. Um, we have an access management policy which is available there. You can download it and have a look through and make sure that um, you're implementing that in your business. And I think it's important to remember that um, using someone else's password is now a crime under the Cyber Crimes Act. Mm. Mm -hmm. So password hygiene, password safety is critical. Mm. Absolutely. And we would obviously um, recommend that you update your um, codes of conduct and mm. your internet policies in line with the Cyber Crimes Act so it is at the forefront of, of your client, your employees' mind, minds, as well as those people that you do business with, your clients and your suppliers. Um, you need to do proper, have proper contracts in place with them to make sure that their hygiene, cyber hygiene, is, is top notch. Because a lot of these attacks uh, happen on the supply chain, and it'll come through one of you, someone you're doing business with. Um, they'll be infiltrated, and you'll be infiltrated as a result. Yeah, yeah correct. Okay. Yeah. So in MAMCAR's previous report, um, their fifth annual report, they found that 52% uh, of South African companies regard lack of cyber sophistication amongst employees as a major threat. 43% of the companies cited employee naivety as one of their greatest weaknesses. So again, it comes down to cyber awareness training of your staff, um, password hygiene, good password hygiene, 
um, constantly watching and monitoring the news and what's happening with data breaches because as soon as there's been a data breach you're going to see an increase in phishing attempts um, also alerting your clients to your clients your suppliers and your employees of the latest attacks and you include that in your training just so that they know what to be aware of and what mechanisms are being used mm -hmm. Okay, we've already mentioned the, the cyber resilience plan. Prevention is, is the best medicine and um, it basically will help you identify how well your organisation can identify and prevent an attack and then how quickly you can recover from it. But we obviously aim to assist you with that. Yeah, that is, as we said, that's in development. So we will, we will release it to everyone um, of, our, of our clients as soon as we possibly can. So I think, Amy, you've said something quite important there. How do you recover from an attack? And it's important <coughs> to know that when you do get attacked, you do have reporting obligations under Poppy. Um, as a responsible party, if you get attacked, the worst thing you can do is try and hide it. Mm. You need to be as transparent as possible with both the information regulator and with every data subject involved. You could face um, administrative penalties from the regulator. The data subject involved can also sue you civilly or criminally. And there's no specific time period in Poppy in terms of which you have to report or by when you have to report. You do get a little bit of latitude to determine the extent of the breach mm -hmm. and to try and mitigate the damage and try and curtail the breach as much as possible. Yeah. It's important to be um, to, to, to make sure that you're going about this as soon as you reasonably yes. can. Um, and take legal advice. The minute you, exactly. you have a data breach, you, mm -hmm. you take legal advice because you can invoke legal privilege in many cases. Yeah. It's important to take those forward steps, not to, not to hold back. Um, yeah, make sure that you, you can secure that information as soon as possible yes, correct. and follow your reporting um, obligations. So Maersk were actually commended for coming upright, out, outright and, mm. and revealing the, the, the attack mm. because they were then able to collaborate with other companies who had experienced the same thing and they were able to uh, assist them in rebuilding their systems. Mm. Exactly. Um, so again, in the MimeCast report, they found that the biggest security risk at companies arises from human error. Seven out of ten companies reported employees' behaviour putting them at the company at risk. And this includes careless web browsing, oversharing of company information on social media, and inadvertent data leaks and poor password behaviour. Mm. So those all seem obvious, but it's, it's happening <coughs> every day, and you need to emphasise to your staff they should not be using work computers to do personal br web browsing. They should not be using their work emails to sign into social media accounts or open up accounts or make online purchases, they should be using their personal email accounts in order to protect the business. Mm -hmm. mm, exactly. And again, as we've said, awareness training needs to be ongoing. Okay, the Cyber Crimes Act, it came into force in December. And basically, one of the, the biggest things is um, the unlawful use of someone's password is now a criminal offence. Um, the theft of incorporeal property, so that's intellectual property, is now a theft un under the common law. Um, they've also basically said any unlawful access, interception of data, acts in respect of software or hardware or computer or data programs um, is all being made a crime. It's much easier to prosecute. The sentences, um, where their sentences are prescribed, um, is um, imprisonment from 5 to 15 years. In some instances, it's at the discretion of the court, so you could be looking at a lot, lot higher um, uh, imprisonment sentences. And also, importantly, where you are an employee who has access to a system and you have committed one of these offences in terms of that system, um, the minimum sentence is imprisonment. So you, you will go to prison if you are an employee who's, who's um, unlawfully interfered, intercepted, taken data, dispersed it, etc. And presumably the sentencing will depend on the offence. Yes, okay. absolutely. And also, the, of course, the intention is a very important aspect of that. It's the intention to go out and, um, and, um, and commit, take, yes. commit that yes. act. Yes, like any crime, there yeah. must be intention. Of course. Yeah. But I mean, prescribed imprisonment, that's unusual for South African legislation. There's yes. usually mm. the option of a fine. Yeah. But I think it's, it's the major step they've taken to deter Deterrent. people because yeah. they know your biggest threat in your organization is your people. Um, and mm. most of these attacks emanate from a person within the organization um, revealing something um, either, either inadvertently or mm. on purpose. And in those instances where there was an intention, um, they will go to prison. Mm. 
Um, Ali mentioned the reporting obligations under POPI. There are also reporting obligations under the Cyber Crimes Act, and it has to be done within 72 hours um, if you are a financial institution or electronic communication service provider. And failure to report is an offence with a fine up to 50,000. Yeah, so, so that's it's not specific, something that's you should be concealing. Specifically for those um, those industries yes. that were mentioned. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I would also not recommend that you take longer than three days to report under Poppy. Yeah. I mean, I no, think three days is enough time to ascertain the extent mm. and to mitigate loss. So you, you don't want to be delaying. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, just some tips for risk mitigation. Consider obtaining cyber insurance and they will give you criteria that you will need to meet and obviously it's always advisable to do that. You regularly train your staff on the risks of cyber attacks and good cyber hygiene and ha have a cyber response plan in place which will be part of your cyber resilience plan. Um, prevent staff from accessing uh, the systems where they don't need to. Use strong passwords for IT systems. Do not share or write down passwords. And avoid leaving your computers unattended for extended periods. Have a policy in place where you have to lock your computer um, when you get up from your desk. It's a clean desk, lock computer policy. Um, um, on, on that, at Norton Rose Fulbright, um, the minute you walk through the door, they take away your cell phone, your iPad, they issue you with a company PC, and you have no option. The, the, everything locks. Um, if you're away from if you're away from the screen for a limited period of time, I think it's a minute. Mm. Um, and then implement multi-factor authentication. So TPN has this, Norton Rose Fulbright has this. When you want to log on to the internal um, VPN, yes. you have to get a notification on your phone, enter a password or face ID, and click approve. And that's critical for your internal systems. And Amy, this is in, this is where the Cyber Crimes Act interplays um, with <coughs> Poppy very nicely because you have all of these obligations under Poppy. You've got to um, assess the risk, internal and external, safeguard, maintain it, update it. And if you don't do that, you're going to fall foul of, of your obligations. Mm. And then you will suffer either an administrative fine or criminal liability. Uh, you can't have both as a responsible party. So if, mm. if um, the regulator has issued criminal proceedings against you, they can't also come um, for an administrative fine, yeah. but both are serious. And let's not forget the reputational and financial yes. implications. Yeah. Um, some tips for your staff. Do not open file attachments from unknown or untrustworthy sources um, with any suspicious subject lines. Um, do not open any attachments and email messages from sources that you don't know personally. Do not click on links with email, within email <coughs> messages except from a trusted source. Um, if you're not sure about it, rather don't click it. If, you, if it's an organization, pick up the phone and phone them. Pick up the phone and phone SARS and try and find out if, if indeed this email is legitimate before you click. Mm -hmm. Verify any link before clicking it by moving your mouse over the browser and it will reveal the actual destination of the mm -hmm. link. Also look out for um, typos and grammatical errors. Those are mm. often indications of a phishing attack. Right. So yeah. what they often do um, is they use those emails to test how vulnerable you are, mm. and then they'll send another one um, that's quite sophisticated, mm. and they know you're going to click on it, so yeah. that's their way in. Um, remote working is obviously incredibly common at the moment, and I think you need to have a remote working policy in place for your staff and um, you need to have policies in place where they're not sharing their passwords with family members, they're not allowing their family members to use their devices for anything, um, that they are obligated to maintain awareness when they're in a public space, to use privacy screens, um, and to fully log out of Wi-Fi um, that is a public uh, Wi-Fi. Yeah, thank you. Um, do we have any sort of final takeaways? Because it seems that we're getting towards our Q&A session. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, as a starting point, I know this is all very overwhelming um, and there's a lot of information that's um, been shared with us today, but a good place to start would be the TPN um, Poppy portal. You can log on to shop.tpn.co.za. Some policies that are on that portal that we've discussed, we have an access management and control policy that deals with who has access to your systems. Um, a backup and restoration policy, so you can restore information if it is lost. A remote working policy. A remote working <laughs> policy. Bring your own device policies. Um, we have an in information incident management policy in there, um, so that if the worst does happen and something um, something does occur, mm. then you have the proper um, the proper policies in place to um, 
to mitigate that. Um, if you've enjoyed today's session, which um, we're coming towards the end of our formal part now, uh, please hit like and subscribe. Um, you can also see this um, session after the session is finished. Um, you can go onto the TPN YouTube channel um, and access it um, in the future going forward. Um, yeah, that brings us towards the end of our formal session. Jade, we're going to go into a bit of a Q&A now. If for whatever reason your question doesn't get answered, um, please feel free to send it through to either helpdesk at tpn.co.za or to legal at tpn.co.za and we'll do our best to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, Jay, do we have any questions coming in? So Greg, firstly I'd like to mention we've been running a few polls throughout today's session. Mm. One of the last polls we ran was a question asking are you currently utilizing the TPN Poppy <coughs> portal? Mm. Of 132 votes from our delegates, 40% of them are using it, 39% are not, and 20% feel like they should start. So to that 20%, please do log on to yeah. the shop today. And again, if you're having any difficulty accessing that portal, we are here available for you. Um, our phone line, our phone number will be posted in the chat as well as the email addresses, which I mentioned before. Um, you can feel free to get in touch with us and we'll help you, we'll help you get through onto that system. And Greg, uh, like on that note, I think um, I was personally involved in, in settling those policies. I think there might mm. be 25 or more different poppy compliant policies that literally all the work's been done for you and it's been um, vetted by qualified attorneys and yeah, experts in poppy. We've done our absolute best to make sure that you um, have as much protection as possible um, going forward with your cyber security. Yes, Jade. Perfect. So I have a question from Lavania, mm. and a lot of our delegates are reiterating that they'd like to know the answer to this one. Mm. So she's saying that she's had requests previously for tenant referrals from other companies. Mm. Is there a specific form that the tenant needs to sign in order for her to release the information? So that's obviously a bit of a poppy question. So Alison, maybe you could take that. Yeah, I, it, it, the tenant, you generally require consent in terms of poppy. There are a mm. few... Um, exceptions. For example, Section 11 of Puppy says that you don't need um, consent if, it was, if it's necessary to perform in terms of a contract. So if it was necessary in terms of a lease agreement to provide that information, yes, mm. you don't need consent. But it's, uh, if, it, if, if it's not part of the performance of the contract or the conclusion of the contract, you would need the consent of the tenant. I think it's also important to note that there's a big difference between running a credit check and getting a reference. Yes. So it's not necessarily going to be um, sensitive information that's being shared on a on a reference phone call. Um, if they've got the um, if they've been given through consent of an application form the phone number and the name of the person, then that's that's been given by consent. But when you're running a credit check, of course, you must gain mm -hmm. written consent to run that credit check through through TPN, as an example. But the referencing is more of a subjective. Um, yeah, I think the most important thing to bear in mind is every time you're dealing with any kind of um, information, and it's broad, it's anything from your name, your email address, your mm. uh, employment information that identifies a natural mm. or juristic person in South Africa. Uh, you need to be mindful of Poppy. The general principle is you need consent unless you are getting the information or process it in order to enter into it or uh, perform in terms of a contract. There are a few other, um, other d uh, exceptions, but those are the main ones. If you have any doubt of whether or not you should get consent, it's always best to get consent. Yes. Awesome, thank you. So we've had a lot of delegates share their own experience with data leaks or mm. cyber attacks. We ran another poll where we asked, have you been a victim for a cyber attack or a data leak? Out of 127 votes from our delegates, 43% voted no, 42% voted that they're not aware, and 14% voted yes. So that's just some interesting stats. And then we've also had a few of our delegates share some of their experiences. Mm. Kim van Nikker doesn't have a question, but she said that her business was hacked through email during hard lockdown in April 2020. Her IT team shut down her entire VPN to mitigate the hacking and had to ring fence parts of her info. So she's saying it should it is something that should definitely be taken seriously. Of course. Okay, then I have a question from Liz, and I do think we're reiterating some information that has already been discussed. But for clarity, she's asking who do you report the cyber attack? Two, should you be attacked? You need to report it to the information regulator. Yeah, so the information regulator is the um, sort of supervisory body for Poppy 
um, in general. They um, go through and make sure that um, in these instances there is um, action taken. Yeah. And to um, the data subjects involved in the breach. Exactly, yes. They also have a right to know. It's also interesting, as an IP lawyer, if you create a database um, in your organisation, you own the copyright in that database. It's a literary work under the Copyright Act. But it's important to bear in mind you don't own the personal information that in that database. Every data subject has got a right to access the information that you hold on them and to perhaps, uh, um, uh, for a minimal fee, ask for a record of that information. It's yes, their yes. information, it's not your information. Okay, thank you. So, as I was saying, I do think, based on the questions, we have already dealt with this. I have a question from Terence Smith, and I think Amy dealt with this when she was discussing risk mitigation, but he's asking, is there any advice on what to do if a threat arises? I think it is inter integral to have an idea as to what to do. So maybe what would be the most important in the first point of call if a threat should arise? So I think at that stage, you need to get hold of a cybersecurity expert. Um, and a lawyer. And a, yeah. and a lawyer um, immediately. Yeah, so that is sort of, um, as we touched on, it's, it's when something has happened. There is that um, policy which we mentioned before, which is the incident management policy. Um, you can go through those um, procedures that are set out that says exactly what you need to do to be um, active and, and go forward and, and do the required steps. And the cyber resilience plan that we're in the process of drafting exactly. that will give you really detailed steps as to mm. what to do. This is just a high level uh, sort of pointer, but that will be a detailed proactive plan. Of course. Perfect. Then the last question that I can see in the chat for now <coughs> is a question from Rivers of Babylon. Where can we obtain cyber insurance? From any broker, broker or underwriter. There's a number of options on the market, so if they approach their broker, they'll provide them yeah. the options. Okay, perfect. That's all from my side. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, if you do have any other questions that arise, um, the um, email address and phone number are on the screen. Please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, Alison and Amy, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. I think an important takeaway that we're going to leave you with is a phrase that Amy said at the, at the beginning. Think before you click. <laughs> Make sure that you are keeping cybersecurity at the front of your mind and um, you know, keep an eye out for, for those attacks. You don't want to become a victim. Thanks, Thank you very Greg. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.